I'm here today with uh, Professor Konstantin Sanders from the Philosophy Department. Uh, welcome, Konstantin. Thanks. Um, first of all, tell me a bit about yourself and how you got into philosophy and to work at the University of Hertfordshire. So this is my second year at Hertfordshire, mm -hmm. so I'm relatively new. I was at, um, in philosophy at Oxford Brookes before for a decade or so and started philosophy as an undergrad but was a kind of reluctant philosopher so slowly learned to like it by mm. the third year. Mm -hmm. um, so I did philosophy and theology mm -hmm. in, for my first degree. Mm. So what convinced you? <laughs> um, strangely, it, it, I took a philosophy of mind um, paper in the third year, so very mm. late on, and it was taught by Peter Hacker um, who I'd never read any Wittgenstein before and so it ended up being more of a Wittgenstein module mm. and I suddenly thought oh maybe I like this kind of philosophy mm. um, so a late conversion in the last minute for better or worse. Oh good for us now. <laughs> uh, fantastic so uh, tell us a bit more so what's the area of philosophy you're working in at the moment? Um, so um, it all goes goes back to that really um, so when I was doing the philosophy of mind paper um, I had an option of doing some ad additional tutorials on action, so mm -hmm. kind of mind and action. So we talked about intention, volition, the will, um, and so on. And really ever since then, um, I've become very interested in, in philosophy of action. And it makes me think that it's kind of what I wanted to do all along. So I wanted to do philosophy and psychology, but I didn't have the maths to do the statistics for the psychology mm -hmm. part. But a lot of philosophy of action relates to what we might call philosophical psychology and mm -hmm. motivational psychology. So not just what are actions, but um, why do we act? Do we always have knowledge of what yeah. we are doing and why we are doing it? What motivates us? What are reasons for action? Mm. Um, and so my first book was on um, action explanation and it looked at debates about the nature of reasons for action. Um, but what I was interested in was how a lot of these debates focused on the ontology of reasons. Mm -hmm. What are reasons? Are they facts? Are they mental states? Mm. Something else? But it said very little about either what actions were mm. or what it is to explain something. So I was trying to bring the literature on action and the literature on reasons um, together with that on explanation and sort of come to the view that we need to know what it is that we are explaining when we are asking why did this action happen mm. or why did someone act? Mm. Fascinating. So do you have a specific project you're working on at the moment? Um, Tell us about yes, that. so I have really, I guess, two, two projects I'm, mm. I'm particularly keen on that, that fall out of this, but I'm um, also moving away from the thoughts about explanation. Um, one is looking at moral philosophy okay. um, and in particular theories of what the right action to perform is and thinking about how just as in the case of action explanation, if there are competing views of what actions are, um, for example, whether actions are events or processes or something else, um, it might affect views about what makes an action right. Mm. For example, intention, character, motive, consequences, mm. um, and so on. So that's one project is looking at how, if we do philosophy of action, um, how that affects um, moral philosophy, and in particular normative ethics, which has theories like consequentialism, mm. virtue ethics, and so on, um, deontology. And the other project, there used to be a big debate, um, a, a, as you'll know, especially among German philosophers and sociologists, about the relation of explanation to understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so I've become very interested in understanding other people as well as understanding oneself, what mm -hmm. it is to understand another person, mm -hmm. how this relates to reasons for action. Mm -hmm. um, and th through that, um, I've become um, even more interested in questions of cultural heritage, which I had a sort of separate um, attachment to before, mm -hmm. but I've, I've now come to see that the question of understanding other cultures is, is fundamental to some of the ethical issues around heritage. And so for me, the, the interest in philosophy of action and understanding others has come together mm. with a separate interest in heritage and heritage yeah. ethics, and particularly um, questions about cultural appropriation and how this relates to understanding another culture. So this is my, my mm. other project. Oh, it's interesting. So it's, it overlaps a lot of different areas, yes, isn't it? And it was a sort of ha happy accident towards yeah. um, the end, but I, I guess it, 
it, it shows that philosophy of action has can be understood quite broadly yeah. um, in ways that, yeah. that touches on, oh. on various concerns. And throughout all this, the Wittgenstein has sort of remained in, in the background, <laughs> but um, one of the books I'm writing on understanding yeah. takes its cue from his famous remark, if a lion could speak, we couldn't understand it. Yeah. And I try and argue that this is not a remark about animals or human-animal relations, but about um, the sort of limits of, of understanding. So it's a kind of limiting case oh. of um, a being where we might have trouble understanding it. And I'm interested in the relation between understanding, say, what you say, uh -huh. and understanding you, where you might understand everything I've told you, but not understand me because you, you might think, well, why on earth would you be interested in that? Yeah. Um, so it might be that the more you understand what I say, the less you understand me, yeah. um, let alone the, the lion. Yeah. Um, so it's all, um, so the Wittgenstein is related uh -huh. to, um, to the understanding things for me more than the action these days. Yeah. Um, but it, it's sort of through a nice, maybe coincidence, maybe it's a case of some form of um, confirmation bias, but it, it's worked yeah. well for heritage for me as well. Yeah, fantastic. So a lot of research in a way, in my experience, also works like this. You just come across things and uh, suddenly once chance and it becomes yeah, um, kind of precious. To a person with a hammer in their hand, yeah. everything looks like a nail. Yeah, right? that's right. <laughs> there we go. Well, looking forward to reading the book, who answered that. So I can't get luck with that. And thanks for speaking to Thank me today. Thank you so much, Thank Sylvie. You. Thanks.